The question I have for you this morning as we start is this. What is the most prized possession that you have? What is, what is the thing that you would say, that is it for me? This is my thing. It was passed down to me perhaps from my ancestors or I purchased it. And this is it for me. It could be your bank account or your pension or an, an antique. What is it that is your most prized possession? I'd like you to think about that as we work our way th through this text this morning and we'll revisit it at the end. The Gospel of John is very selective in how it writes the life of Christ. His stories in John are longer encounters with specific people. Like Nicodemus. There's a whole chapter for Nicodemus. Or like John chapter 9, there's a man born blind. The whole chapter is dedicated to that person and that story. The other writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, move quickly from one story to the next. You just kind of rapid fire. They're just showing you all of these amazing things that Jesus said and did. But John is more methodical. And about half of his book focuses on the last week of the life of Christ, chapter 12 through chapter 21. You've got to ask yourself why that is. Why would he uh, write like that? Why would he devote so much time to the, the last week of Christ's life? So as we move towards Easter, I want to turn your attention towards that final week. And I'd like to read for you a piece of scripture as it leads us into that final week. It's from John chapter 11. Uh, verse 55 through 57, you remember the first part of John 11 is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So here we go. Verse 55, John 11. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. As they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so they might arrest him. Probably most of you have been in a large crowd at some point in your lifetime going to a concert or a sporting event or a county fair or a tractor pull or whatever we do. There's a bunch of people going the same direction and you get this sense of anticipation. There's something cool that's going to happen. I talked with a couple friends who were going to the Friday night Sabres game to honor Rick Jenneret. And man, they were looking so forward to that and their, their anticipation was fulfilled with great joy. That kind of feeling. Uh, Jesus probably attended every Passover feast from age 2 to age 29. Only one of those times is mentioned in Scripture, of course. That would be when he was 12 years old. Remember that story from Luke chapter 2 when he went up to the festival with his parents according to the custom. And of course, everybody in those days followed the custom. They went to Jerusalem for the Passover. That's just what they did. And they went with this sense of anticipation. But it was turned up to high level on this occasion this Passover was very different, first because it would be the last one that Jesus attended in person, but second, if Jesus actually showed up at this Passover feast, there were going to be fireworks. The, the trap was already laid, right? You already see it. People were looking to arrest Jesus. Josephus, the Roman historian, observed that during the Passover, the population of Jerusalem often rose to over three million people. <clears throat> Hard to imagine. It would be like Buffalo hosting the Super Bowl. You know, there just aren't enough hotels and Airbnbs to accommodate all the travelers. So that meant that people camped out or shared a room or just did what they had to do to be in the city or around the city at that time. They came from all over the place, including many countries. We find later in Acts, Paul wanted to go back 
uh, from Asia Minor and Greece. He wanted to go back to Jerusalem for the Passover. And that's what the custom was. That's what people did. But John notes that people came early because they had to purify themselves. We don't really have action steps that we go through before we enter the auditorium for worship on Sunday morning. But, you know, other, other religions do. I mean, there's uh, some that have to wash before they enter and ceremonially. And that's what the, the Jewish population was doing. For seven days they ate bread made without yeast. Oh, rats. For you, that might mean uh, no donuts and no cake for a, for a while. You know, sorry, you're out of luck. But that was the custom. Uh, bread without yeast. And they were not supposed to do any work for these days. Well, that kind of puts you on a kind of a holiday, but kind of guys after a few days, you're wondering, what, what, are, what are we supposed to do? And ladies, you know, I know what you're, you're busy. You're doing stuff. And, but this was a time to focus on the Lord, to keep yourself from work. And you were supposed to keep yourself pure. And sometimes people weren't allowed to participate in the Passover because someone in their family passed away and they had to attend to the burial and that made them ceremonially unclean. And then there was this lamb. Every family had to get a lamb, they had to obtain a lamb somewhere and prepare it for the feast. So there was a lot going on. A lot of things were happening here. That was the custom. But in this situation, gas was added to the fire because the authorities were looking for Jesus. Uh, he was the most well-liked and popular person in the country, but as far as the high court was concerned, he was public enemy number one, and he was on the most wanted list. There was a warrant out for his arrest. So people wondered, gosh, you know, is he actually going to show up? Because this is going to mean sure trouble if he does. Maybe he should stay away. It is amazing how we all love to be around famous people. If we're around some celebrity, we, we want to tell other people, <clears throat> excuse me, that we saw this person. I mean, grown men uh, would die for a selfie with Josh Allen. You know, I got it. I got it. You know. And uh, women here in the group, I imagine some of you, if you would be genuinely honest with us, some of you probably screamed over the Beatles or over Elvis or some music group or some celebrity. We're like that. We're, we, we all want to be around famous people. I don't know, maybe it makes us feel more special or something. But we want everybody to know that we saw them. So everybody in this case wanted to have a selfie with Jesus. I find... As I read through the Gospels, which I encourage you to do frequently, just read through the Gospels, I find these six reactions. You've heard me say this before, but I keep adding to the list. Um, people, when they met Jesus, had these reactions. They all start with A. Uh, some were afraid of him. Some were astonished and astounded and amazed and awed. And some were just downright angry. They just gritted their He's like, mm, who does he think he is? And so you have all of these reactions at this Passover time. All this was going on. These, and you've probably had these reactions with Jesus too. Sometimes you're amazed at him. Sometimes you're angry saying, why did you let this happen? And everything in between. And even now, many years later, the name of Jesus has this drawing power. Look, I know people use it wrongly in profanity, but if you use it rightly, if you, if you bring up Jesus, uh, there's attention given to it. There's not total respect, but there's respect given to the name of Christ. Yeah, I was, you see, I was reading in the Bible and I saw where Jesus said, and everybody, well, what did he say? People want to know that. So everyone is curious about Jesus. And that's the first group that John mentions in this setting, is the curious. But let's move on now to the main part of the story, which moves us on now from chapter 10 to chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 11 to chapter 12. I'm going to read just a 
couple paragraphs for you, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in honor of Jesus. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining with him at the table. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. <laughs> as far as I can see it, the gospel mentions eight times when Jesus accepted a dinner invitation. Uh, three of those were among friends like you and I, just a normal social gathering. There was a wedding feast in, Gal in Cana. There was a previous dinner in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And there was a meal after Jesus rose from the dead with the two guys on the road to Emmaus where he revealed himself. It's just an enjoyable, encouraging time to be with friends and share food. There's lots of laughter. There's lots of conversation. The dinner just goes on because it's just enjoyable. And uh, boy, that was something that we were robbed of with COVID. And now that COVID is over, I hope our church family can get back to gatherings uh, to enjoy each other's company. I miss that very much. I especially miss the pie that comes with those dinners. Hint, hint. Um, but there's five other times when Jesus ate with people that are surprising. Uh, it's, uh, it's surprising both in Bible times and in our times. Once he ate with a Pharisee named Simon, where a woman did the same thing as Mary did in this story. She, she washed Jesus' feet with her hair. Simon the Pharisee, a group of Pharisees around, they saw this, it was just... Um, it was awkward, like, what is, what is happening? Have you ever seen that done at a dinner? Another time he was weeding with a group of Pharisees on a Sabbath day when a, a broken man came in, and right there in front of all of them, Jesus healed the guy. The first one, the first enters Luke 7, 44. The second one is Luke 14. That caused fireworks because Jesus healed this guy in front of them on the Sabbath day. Two times Jesus ate with very questionable characters. He ate with Matthew, uh, chapter 9 of Matthew, a tax collector. He brought all of his ordinary friends in with him for a dinner, and Jesus went right there and ate. That's when he was accused of being a friend of sinners. And the second time he did that was with Zacchaeus, another uh, tax collector that everyone looked down on. And so those are places, and that was Luke 17, those are places where Jesus was accused of hanging out with the wrong kind of people. It's just at dinner. And then finally here in the home of Simon the leper. I get it that it's in the home of Simon the leper because you compare the, the other stories about this story that John told that I read to you. John chapter 12 compares to Matthew 26 and Mark 14. So if you were studying along, you'd put your finger in three places in the Bible and read the different details as they're added together. Simon the leper's house. <clears throat> Jesus is good friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We know that. We know previous encounters with, with them. Uh, but the host here is Simon the leper. <laughs> uh, that's all we know about this guy. He's hospitable. 
He's a friend of Jesus and he's a leper. Well, wait a second. I'd add that he probably was a former leper because if he was still a leper, nobody would come to his house, right? He had probably been healed or he could not have hosted this dinner. So it is implied from the text, I can't prove this, it's implied from the text that Jesus cured this man of his leprosy. We have many instances where lepers were cured that were not named in the scriptures. I am assuming for this story that he was in that crowd of healed lepers. Can't say when it happened or where it happened. But Simon, for some reason, is filled with gratitude and opened his home to this dinner party while knowing there was great threat to anybody who was a friend of Jesus. Now would you think about that for just a second. Do you have any friends named Simon the fill-in-the-blank? Any friends like that? Would you consider a dinner invitation with someone who had a contagious disease? Um, COVID has caused us to be very cautious with people, hasn't it? And I have a suggestion. I have a suggestion for Russell Salvatore's Italian Gardens. I suggest a name change. What do you think of this? Put a sign out there, take down Salvatore's Italian Gardens and put up Simon the Lepers. Everybody welcome. Everybody welcome. Come on in and join us. You're all welcome. And I would like to add that the timing of this dinner is very important. Um, this is the night before the day of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday that we call next week. Jesus knew what was ahead of him. Tomorrow, the adoring crowd would celebrate him, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they would take off their jackets and cut palms and put them down and hail him as king. And then, just a few days later, the crowd would shout, Crucify him. Crucify him. In the week ahead, there would be celebration and teaching. There would be betrayal and desertion and mocking and flogging and agonizing death. There would be this something that we can't see. There would be this uh, unseen burden on Jesus as the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And of course, the resurrection awaited on the other side of all that. Now, most of you know, a week from tomorrow, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to go in for surgery. And uh, I, I have some things on my mind. A lot of you have gone through surgery before. You, you contemplated it. You knew what was ahead. In my case, I've, I've talked to other people who've had the surgery. Uh, I've Deb and I met the other day with this medical team, just one after another, who worked us through all the details, and my head was spinning with stuff. Uh, but I, I talked to other people who had a surgery. They made it through. It kind of calmed my mind. If they did it, that I could do it too. But still, you all have been, a bunch of you have been there where you're facing surgery, and you're going like, gulp. wonder how that's going to work out. One of the best guys I talked to said, hey, Mike, just... Uh, just go in there and go to sleep. Wake up. It'll be all over. You'll be fine. <laughs> I said, yeah, I need that. But you guys, uh, the surgeries that we face through medicine are different than what Jesus is facing here, right? This is, this is much heavier. Jesus is doing something that's never been done before. All of history hinges on what he is going to do. Your eternity is based on what he is going to do in this next week. The weight of the world was on his shoulders. And if you can just think for a second, would heaven allow it? Would Almighty God allow the Lamb of God to be sacrificed? Would he at the last minute say, wait a second, this is a very bad idea. Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will be done in the garden. Uh, 
yeah, I would rather it be my will and we just put a halt to this whole thing. Just stop it right here. But on his mind was not surgery, but his sacrifice to cancel out the sins of the world. Wow. Six days before the Passover. The next week would change the world forever, and he alone knew it. No one at the dinner party knew what was on his mind and his heart. Still, they loved him and did the best they could to welcome him and encourage him. Each of his three friends were doing their thing. Martha the servant was working. Lazarus was just hanging out with Jesus, fellowshipping. And Mary was preparing her gift. I love it that every one of them was doing the thing that was in their giftedness, in their character, to do what they could. Martha served. She might have found it hard to speak in public or to sing a song in public, but if you put that girl in the kitchen, her gift is food, and she let her food do the talking. Okay, so her brother Lazarus was raised back to life. She was there. She saw it. She's filled with joy, and she wants to honor the Lord by serving him with hospitality and food. And Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever it is that you do, do it for him. It is worship to him. So if you're doing it for the Lord, teaching a class, uh, repairing a faucet, singing a slow, solo, a mop on a floor, whatever it is that you do, you're doing it for him. That is your worship to him. And in most cases, uh, Lazarus would be the celebrity at this party, right? He would, be the, he would be the center of attention almost all the time. Just a few weeks ago, this guy was stone cold dead. And now, there he sat, and every reporter on the planet would like to have an exclusive interview with him. You know, every movie producer would like to get on the inside of that and hear that story and see if they can make that into a movie. Everybody wanted a selfie with him. Most of the time. But not at this dinner. Lazarus draws no attention to himself. We don't get any words from him. But wouldn't you like to have some words from him? John, why didn't you put a couple words down? No, because he's not the center of the story. Lazarus is only one of a few people in the Bible to die twice. So he's got a lot to say. <laughs> what an interesting dinner guest he would be, but he's not the center. He's pictured here just as openly, openly befriending, enjoying fellowship with Jesus. And I don't know you guys. I read the scripture with a uh, sense of, you know, just this humor. There's a lot of funny things in the Bible. I think it's funny that the enemies of Jesus wanted to kill Lazarus again. Let's try that again. Let's do this, okay? I imagine both Jesus and Lazarus had a good laugh over that. Here was a guy who tasted death and knew what awaited on the other side of death. He knew all about death. And he sat beside the Almighty One, the keeper of the keys of death and Hades. He had the keys in his hand. He had power over death. And so Lazarus is just sitting there saying, yeah, these guys are going to kill me or think they can kill me, but Lazarus felt no threat. What's the worst that can happen to me? They're going to kill me? Been there. Done that. And all that. Jesus is in the house. That's all I need to know. He's right here beside me. Let's go for it. Enjoy your Big Mac. Then there's Mary. Uh, in Bible times, anointing was very common. You know that? Um, you've read that before. Anointing meant that you were setting somebody apart for some reason. Like David was anointed to be king in the Old Testament. Elisha was anointed to be a prophet. Aaron was anointed to be a priest. But this anointing was very different, wasn't it? Jesus said later, she's anointing me for my burial. And I think probably everybody in the room goes, Burial? What? You're the king. Tomorrow we're going to celebrate you. What are you talking about? A burial for? We're, we're going to establish the kingdom here. And you're going to be the, the king. 
What are you talking about burial? You guys, I need to talk to you straight up about perfume. We need to get better at this. Here's the deal. This perfume was worth a year's salary, <laughs> which tells you that the giver was radical in her generosity. Guys, there is a perfume called Number One for Men. I just want you to know I did a little scouting for you so you can smell better. Uh, Number One for Men by Clive Christian. 1.6 ounces will cost you $500. Okay, but you get a nice bottle with it and you'll smell very good. Think about that. There's a, there's a second one that I looked, and you guys, I would welcome you to uh, look it up for yourself. You can do it on the phone right now if you want to. You have my permission. Just look up expensive perfumes and see what you can come up with. I found one called Roja Hutre Lux. They only make 500 bottles at a time, so hurry up. It's gone fast. Uh, it will cost you, one bottle will cost you $3,500 for one bottle of perfume. But here's the idea I read at the end of their advertisement. This is a heads up for you, so you'll know this. The more you pay per, per, for perfume, the less likely you are to come across someone else wearing the same spray as you do. So you will be unique. Okay? And I read that and I thought, man, I had some brothers that were unique, but man, man, you probably did too. Now, the John doesn't tell us how and where Mary came to get this rare perfume. I don't know where she got it. Maybe it was passed down from her grandmother to her somehow. Maybe. Some commentators that I read this week said they thought the perfume came from far away. Maybe as far as India. Maybe from Egypt. There are perfumers there. Obviously, uh, it came in an exquisite bottle of some kind. It was the most valuable item in her possession, right? She didn't have anything worth more than that. A year's wages, I'll bet. And John just moves right along with the story. She broke the seal. <laughs> Matthew and Mark, in their version of the story, say she poured it on Jesus' head and it ran down over his body. John said she poured it on his feet and she used her own hair as a towel. And the fragrance filled the house. And the dinner party stopped right there. You were just about ready to have dessert stop. No, forget that. Something amazing is going on in there. What is the most valuable item in your possession, would you say? Have you got it narrowed down to a few things? Think about it. Matthew and Mark reveal that Judas, who was in the crowd at the party, thought it was a total waste of time and money. And it seems a reasonable thing to say, don't you think? I mean, it seems reasonable, practical. He's a practical thinking guy. That's what you think when you first read about him until you read more. It's kind of like, well, I don't know. I've heard this argument this week. It's kind of like spending $1.4 billion on a brand new football stadium that might be used 20 times a year. And you may have thought when you read that story this week, 1.4, is, isn't there some better use of that money? Probably you thought that. It's a reasonable thing to think and say. But Jesus defended her, saying she had done a beautiful thing. And whenever the gospel, wherever the gospel goes, her story's going to go with it. And it will be a memorial to her. I don't know what was gone through her heart and her head. I, I mean, she had been there when her brother was raised from the dead, you will do just about anything to get your loved one back. What would you give if someone saved your brother's life? How could you say thank you? 
She spared no expense. Think of it. She interrupted a room of men where women aren't normally welcomed or expected. She let her hair down, which was unthinkable in that culture. Then she openly expressed her love in this very undignified way. Reminds me of a story in the Old Testament where David was accused of being undignified when he danced before the Lord. Remember that story? Same thing here, but that's how love acts. You've been there. A bunch of you have been there. There's a 70s song, 70s song that says, uh, the things we do for love, the things we do for love. Remember that song? The things we do for love. Wow, you guys could write a book on that subject of almost ridiculous things that you have done for love for people, uh, for your loved ones. Just crazy things. Uh, married couples have all kinds of stories about this. A long time ago, my mom wanted to do something special for my dad, and she quietly prepared a gift for Christmas. She uh, went out and bought the biggest map of the United States that she could find. Then she quietly talked to a guy in a church who was a woodworker and asked him to make a frame for that map. And then put a big glass piece in front of it to protect it. Giant frame. And uh, on Christmas, she gave that to my dad, who was thrilled with it because he got the map out, put it on the dining room table, spread it out. I can still see him doing that. He put the encyclopedias on every corner. You guys know encyclopedias? Remember those? The big heavy books tell you all kind of answers and stuff. Those things, he put them on the corner and then he traced on the map all the trips that our family had made to the 48 lower states in the country. And my dad had this memory of, I remember when we stayed there and we took that route and we went up there and saw that. And he was like that, you know? And then they put it back together and hung it on the wall, which has become the centerpiece of our house where I grew up. It's still there today. It's that my dad treasures it. My mom went overboard to do that quietly for him. And my dad, I would say that's probably it for him. That's probably the thing that he loves most in the house. The things we do for love. And you guys all have those stories in your family of things that people have done. Just the tremendous sacrifice, how inspiring and encouraging it is. And how my dad feels about that map is how Jesus felt about that perfume, right? Her gift was expensive, but... He appreciated the heart that gave that gift, right? It was extravagant. She was will, willing to do anything for the Lord. Foster said this, in the middle of this emotional scene, Jesus and his enemies were on a collision course. <laughs> All this on his mind. The very next day he would enter the city on a donkey and though no one understood it, he said he was being anointed for his burial. It wouldn't be but about five days. Worship comes from a heart that is amazed and astonished and astounded and awed by Jesus Christ. And when you get there, it's not a sacrifice. It's a pleasure, isn't it? You just, that's a debt. It's just a joy to share with him what he's done for me. And so there was a storm circling that dinner party at Simon the leper's house in Bethany that night. Curious people were looking for a celebrity. The counterfeit, Judas, was looking for a payday. The critics were looking to silence Jesus any way they could, and the committed ones, Martha and Mary and Lazarus and Simon and some others were only there to give honor to the Lord. 
Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Simon. Apart from their association with Jesus, we, we don't know much more about them. They're really just slipped back into obscurity again. But they represent you. They represent the heart of anyone who just wants to express their honor to the Lord and then give their gift in their way. Whatever your gift is, give it. Jesus knew that he would pay the highest price in the next week for people like you and me. I just want to give you, a, I can invite the worship team up, I just want to give you a flavor of what happens at the end of this chapter 12. There's these groups of people. I'm going to like to read for you from John chapter 12 verse 37. John writes these words, Despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still didn't believe in him. That's verse 37. Then you skip to verse 42. It says, many people did believe in him, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved, they loved human praise more than the praise of God. And there's the dilemma, isn't it? We're doing stuff to be seen, to be recognized, to be patted on the back. So I return back to this uh, question from the beginning. What would you say is your most valuable possession? You got it figured out yet? You got it narrowed down? The, the most valuable possession you have is your life. That's what it is and who it belongs to and how you live it and I ask you to live it for Christ because this is what it says this is what he's done for you you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty he could make you rich that's what he's done for you what do you give someone who's done that for you your life. I ask you to give your life to him today. If you haven't done that, I would invite you to come. Repent of your past. Be baptized in the watery grave of baptism. Be raised to walk in a brand new life. Start over and live it for him.